Six Tudor Queens, Anna of Cleffa, Queen of Secrets, Part 2. Today I want to talk about the fourth book in the series, Six Tudor Queens, Anna of Cleffa, The Queen of Secrets, by Alison Weir. This video has been broken into three parts because it is so long. The third part of this review will be coming out next week. This video will be the fourth in a series covering Alison Weir's Six Tudor Queen books and her other historical novels. In the first part of this review, we covered Anna's teenage years, her journey to England and her marriage to King Henry. We pick up just after the wedding ceremony. After the wedding ceremony, there is a feast and dancing, but Anna doesn't know how to dance and is terrified when the king leads her out on the floor. She doesn't want to make a fool of herself. Anna and the king dance a pavan together and Anna gets through it without making an embarrassment of herself. But then it is time for the formal bedding, and Anna is shaking with nerves. When Anna and Henry are formally put to bed, she is very embarrassed about men being able to see her in her night clothes. Anna also suddenly remembers she has forgotten to put a needle under her pillow to prick her finger for a show of blood after the fact. Then everyone leaves Anna and Henry alone together for the first time. Anna laments the fact she is not more proficient at English. As Henry starts talking to her and touching her, he says something about being able to please a woman and then pulls up her night grill ready to lunge, but then he doesn't move, he just stares at her breasts and belly for a long time. Anna shrinks inwardly with embarrassment, but then realises Henry is staring at the faint silver stretch marks on her stomach that her pregnancy left. Then he moves away, saying he is tired and Anna is fully aware Henry knows something is wrong with her. Anna cries about her wedding night to Mother Lova the following morning, but Mother Lova assures her that Henry is just old, fat and impudent, and Anna has nothing to worry about. But even though Henry tries a few more times, he never manages to be intimate with Anna. Instead, they fall to talking or playing cards. Anna falls into the routine of the court easily, and eventually Henry gives up even trying to be physical with her. Anna is sad at the prospect of no love life and no more children, but she knows she can bear it. I find it interesting that unlike with Henry's previous three queens, he never gives Anna the queen's jewels, and I think this is a sure sign he was never fully invested in the relationship. Anna is asked by the king via messenger to stop wearing German fashions, and she is very upset by this, because now her trousseau, lovingly put together by her mother, is useless and must be altered. She is also deeply hurt by the fact the king did not ask this of her in private. Anna starts wearing English gowns and finds them much more comfortable. The downside is she feels half naked in the low-cut bodices. Anna's German attendants go back to Cliffa, happy, thinking Anna's marriage a success and expecting her to be crowned and pregnant within the next few weeks. Anna keeps expecting her coronation, but it is postponed again and again. She eventually asks Henry about it, and he confesses to her that he cannot afford to crown her, so she gives up asking. Then there is a rumour circulated about the court that the king finds Anna's body repellent, and she knows the gossip had to have started with Henry. She is very upset by it and she tries to confront Henry about the rumour in private, but her English still isn't good and she comes across much harder than she meant to, and ends up having to apologise to Henry, even though he was the one in the wrong. Despite all this though, Anna remains pleasant to the king, and she is growing fond of him. He is always polite to her and shows her small kindnesses. She thinks they will grow closer in time. Anna meets Prince Edward, and likes the little boy, which strengthens her resolve to be a mother to Henry's younger children. While all this is going on, there is much political manoeuvring on the part of the Howards, and Cromwell seems very unhappy, but Anna is determined to stay out of politics after mentioning to Henry once she thought Princess Mary should be restored to the succession, and feeling his wrath. Anna is as happy as she can be. She is even glad to have Henry back in her bed after Lent. But then there are jousts and feasts to celebrate May Day, and Anna notices the king flirting with Catherine Howard. 
she is a little upset by it and asks Mother Lova and Susanna about Catherine. But on discovering that Catherine Howard is a pauper, Anna decides she has nothing to worry about. But then Anna notices Catherine and the king together a few more times, even though she is trying to be blind to it. Then she overhears gossip that the king has made Catherine Howard a gift of land and money. She asks Susanna if this is true, and Susanna tells her that the gossip about the king and Catherine is all over the court. Anna is shocked and deeply hurt that her friend, the lady she considered her best friend, Susanna, didn't tell her this gossip. But then, out of nowhere, Catherine asks to leave court, and Anna thinks all her problems are over, and sets about trying to enchant the king by wearing English fashions. During this time, there is a bit of political shifting that Anna feels the effects of slightly. The Duchess of Richmond, Mary Howard, is much more forward, and Thomas Cromwell sends Anna a message to be pleasant to the king, which Anna finds extremely irritating because she is always pleasant to the king. Then, out of what seems like nowhere, Cromwell is arrested for being a Protestant, and Anna is a little worried, but thinks to herself it has nothing to do with her really because she is a good Catholic and the king knows this. Then Anna is told she will be moving to Richmond Palace because there is plague in London, but when she asks around, there is no plague in London and she is confused by the lie. Anna likes Richmond, but is confused about being there and starts to worry that she is there because Cromwell arranged her marriage. Then her stepdaughters, Lady Mary and the Lady Elizabeth come to visit her and introduce themselves, and Anna is enchanted by the six-year-old Elizabeth and wishes to be a good stepmother to her, but is unsure about Mary, who is very cold until she confirms Anna is a good Catholic. Anna thinks it is obvious to anyone looking at Mary that the woman is deeply touched by grief and overly intense on the subject of religion and Anne Boleyn, and perhaps isn't the best person, considering her views of Elizabeth's mother, to be raising the child. The visit of Henry's daughters makes Anne more confident of Henry's good favour, and when he himself comes to visit her and they pass a merry afternoon together, she feels confident. The king says he will visit the following day, and Anna decides she is going to try and seduce him by wearing a low-cut English gown, and feels very good when he catches Henry looking at her breasts. But Henry seems distracted on the second day, and Anna is unsure of his feelings towards her. Anna goes to bed a little worried, but decides to put it from her mind. But then, in the middle of the night, she is awoken by Mother Lova, who says the king's commissioners are here to see her, and Anna is confused and bewildered, and immediately decides they are here because the king is dead. Why else would she have been awoken in the middle of the night? Her logic does make sense. The commissioners tell Anna the king has grave doubts about their marriage and wants to investigate it. Anna is confused by this and so grateful that Henry is alive that he wants to agree straight away, but her political brain makes her prevaricate and ask to see her ambassador, Dr. Hask. He takes quite a while arriving, and when he gets there he is hesitant to tell Anna what to do, or even give any advice, and Anna understands in that moment that this decision must be hers alone. After talking to some other people and getting their opinion, she agrees to let the church examine her marriage. Anna is very scared. The fates of Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon are fresh in her mind, and she starts trying to figure out what she could do if the king decides he wants to divorce her. Anna is also petrified her secret will be discovered if she decides to put up a fight to save her marriage. The king obviously knows that she has borne a child, and she needs to protect herself and her son. But on the other hand, Anna doesn't want to let down Cleves, and is worried her divorce will mean the Emperor is able to invade her brother's lands. Being a sensible woman, Anna decides to put her own safety first, and makes it plain that she will grant Henry a divorce if he is generous to her financially. She makes this decision over a couple of days, during which time Anna is harassed by the small council and on tender hooks she will be taken to the tower and never come out. Her own safety and protecting her secret are Anna's top priority. With this in mind, she decides she will stay in England, fearing that her divorce will displease her brother 
Wilhelm, and if he discovers she has born a child out of wedlock, he will murder her. When Anna's divorce is announced to her, even though she was expecting it, it is a shock and she faints with relief because she has escaped death. Anna is still upset though because she has lost the title of queen, but is happy she is now considered a member of the English royal family. Even if she thinks, like the rest of the world, it is very strange, she is now considered the king's sister. The only thing Anna asks for during her divorce is the possibility of being able to see the Lady Elizabeth, which speaks volumes to Anna's frustrated maternal instincts. Anna starts trying to settle into her new life when out of nowhere, the ambassador, Dr. Haas, informs her the Privy Council have some damning evidence about Anna's body, which obviously came from the king directly. Anna is in terror, but tries to play it all off with indignation and embarrassment. But she isn't sure she sold the lie fully, and now she knows there is a gap between herself and her ambassador, Dr. Hask. There is also the fallout from her divorce to deal with. What will happen when the rest of Europe find out what Henry has done with his new wife? Henry's privy council are doing damage control and trying to force Anna to write to her brother Wilhelm, saying she is happy about her divorce. Anna refuses, firstly because she is terrified of Wilhelm, because he will think she has failed him and cost him an ally, and secondly because honestly she isn't happy about her divorce at all. Eventually, the small council show Anna a letter to Henry from Wilhelm confirming he is not angry with her and that he is happy with the situation. Anna knows, however, that Wilhelm is not being completely open in his letter, however, and finds out through her ambassador that Wilhelm is very worried about her safety. This is not surprising considering the fate of Anne Boleyn. Then Anna feels bad about misjudging her brother. I was surprised Anna was so scared of Wilhelm's reaction because he was so kind to her when she left Cleves. But I guess in the context of the book, Anna is still very scared of anyone discovering she has had a baby. After this, Anna settles into her new life as a lady of leisure and means, keeping out of the public eye. She keeps busy by planning progresses to her new estates. But she is a little disconcerted at having received Hever Castle because it formerly belonged to the Boleyns. This is the end of the second part of this book review. If you enjoyed it, like this video and leave a comment to please the tyrannical YouTube algorithm and subscribe so you won't miss the third part of this review which is coming out next week. You can also follow me on Instagram at Lady Jessica Riddell. Until next time, remember, God send me well to keep.